I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in your minds and your, write it on your their God, and they shall be my people. Now, if you understand the commandments, it was with fire. The voice of God. They were expecting that a, that at Pentecost time, which was Shavuot, or the time that that the law was given on Mount Sinai, it's all the same thing. They were expecting that when the anniversary would come, at some point, God was going to reissue His word. He was going to reissue His covenant. So since he came with power, and he came with fire, he would come again. He would come on a mountain. He would come with fire. His, his voice would be heard. But this time, instead of the law being on tables of stone, the law would be written in their heart. And so for thousands of years, every time this season would come, they were expecting, is this the year that God will give the law, the Torah again, and he'll give it with power. He'll give it with fire. He'll write it in our hearts. This is a covenant promise, and we're waiting for him to come back. Yes. And so you can understand when he did come back, it was not on Mount Sinai, but what mountain was it on? Mount Zion. And this time, did the fire come? On Pentecost, was there fire? Yes. Tongues of fire, it says Cain. And was the voice of God heard? was heard through tongues. God anointing people to speak for him in tongues. With fire. With power. And he wrote the law in their hearts. The new covenant promise that the Christian church claims as theirs was promised to the house of Israel. And this is the, the promise that I will make unto the house of Israel. After those days I will put my law in their hearts and their eyes. We get to participate in this new covenant which is recorded in Hebrews chapter 8 because we're grafted in with Israel to the promises. Amen. You don't get to have it without Israel. I'm sorry. It was made a promise made to them. We're grafted in with them. And we don't believe in replacement theology that the church replaces Israel because that's not biblical. We're grafted in with them and God is going to keep honoring his covenant promises to them. And so we see a, a wonderful fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. Let's turn there. Now the, the term Pentecost is <clears throat> our English translation. The Hebrew term is Shavuot. So we begin to read here in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came the sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and it set on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. And they were, they were confused. They wondered what this was. And, they, and uh, they began to question it. And so Peter stood up in their midst and answered um, in verse 15, These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And that's a quote here from, from uh, Joel. Uh, chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your, men, your young men shall say visions, and your old men shall have dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit um, in those days, and they shall prophesy. Amen. There's a partial fulfillment here in the early church. But there's a latter rain or a latter application fulfillment that's going to come just before the end for the harvest time. We're living in those days where the harvest is going to come. Amen. We're expecting another fulfillment of Pentecost, another outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, another covenant promise fulfilled. Because there will be an early rain and a latter rain, it says in Joel chapter 2. Now in Palestine, in biblical times, the early rain was to germinate the seed so that it would grow. And then right before the harvest, there would be a latter rain that would come to ripen the seed so it would be ready. 
What happened here in the book of Acts chapter 2 is the early rain. It's the preparation for bringing the fruit. But there's going to be now a latter rain that will come uh, for a harvest before Christ returns. He's going to have a harvest. And he's going to pour out his spirit. And it's all, this all has to do with this season we're in, with Pentecost, with Shavuot. His spirit is going to bring the harvest. It's so important that we are seeking the anointing, that we're seeking to be filled. You know, it's great that last year you had a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. But do you need to have one every year? In fact, you need to have one daily. Amen. Now, I got a, I got a new car, and uh, it's, it's a Toyota Ram 4. And I like it. It's a nice little car. But um, it comes with special instructions. And the instructions are, every 10,000 miles, change the oil. And you can't use the old, the old 30 weight cheap oil in it. It takes synthetic oil. It's a specialized oil. And if you run the wrong kind of oil in it, it'll harm the motor. It won't run at its optimum. Listen, I think God is saying in these last days, we have to have the, the actual oil of heaven. You can't run on doctrine and get by. You can't run on tradition and get by in these last days. You've got to have the genuine Holy Spirit oil filling your engine and filling your life on a daily basis. Amen. It, you know, I know there are some folks that think, well, when we get a special speaker comes to town or somebody comes and we're going to have an anointing and that guy, you know, he'll, that guy, he'll bring the anointing and we'll get to listen to him and we'll get to have some of that anointing. Now, it is true that an anointed man or woman of God can minister and, and their anointing will rub off on you because the word anointing means to rub off or to smear. But God wants us to have our own anointing from heaven. Amen. And, it, and it's costly. You know what the, garden of, the word Gethsemane means? It means oil press. When the Savior went through the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through the oil press so that we could have the Holy Spirit. When we press in, we receive the oil. Now, I've shared some in the class. You can't put God in a box because if you press in and begin to ask for the oil, it can come in different ways. You might begin to get visions or prophesying. Because in the book of Acts, when they laid hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit, they both t prayed in tongues and prophesied. Yes. And the love of God is an evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. So my point is, when we ask God for fresh oil, some of us, come on now, some of us need an oil change today. You've been running, you've been running on the same oil too long. Come on. But when we, when we begin to lift up the word of God and ask him for the anointing, ask him for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, Amen. we're so accustomed to microwave delivery that we don't have the patience to wait and tarry. We need to rediscover the tarrying time. You know, Christ said to the disciples, could you not tarry with me one hour? Some of us struggle with 10 minutes. Could you not tarry with me one hour? We tarry until we get the breakthrough. And I'll, I'll challenge you to do this. Pray for the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling of baptism of the Holy Spirit this week. And you ask God to give you a sign when you have received, and, and you tell him, Father, I'm not going anywhere. Because Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 6, go into your closet and close the door, for the Father is waiting for you in the closet. Amen. you got a divine appointment waiting for you this week. To come into the closet and close the door. And ask him, Father, I don't want to leave until I have received. Would you tell me, show me, give me an evidence of your spirit when I've received? When I first started doing this, I didn't know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was going to a non-spirit-filled Bible college. But I was convicted that I need the spirit. So I would, at lunch, I would sacrifice my lunch, and I'd pray an hour during lunch, asking God for his spirit. And one day I was praying, and I, and I just began to yawn, and I couldn't stop. And I could tell I was receiving from God. 
I said, Lord, I don't understand. Is that in the Bible? He said, go to John chapter 20. It says, Christ breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. How do you suppose they received him? They breathed him in. Amen. That's what I, all I could understand and relate to. So that's what God gave me. And other times when I have prayed, um, God will just overwhelm me with a sense of his love and joy. You know, that's an evidence that God is imparting to you. Don't put him in a box. You come to him and ask him for his best. Ask him to be filled with his spirit and be ready for whatever he gives you. Amen. At recent times, I've been asking for the anointing and um, it shows up with oil being poured on my head. You can't see it, but I feel it actually running down my face and sometimes I have to like... I don't care how he sends it. I want the anointing. Amen. I want to cherish it. Because it brings with us every blessing from heaven comes with anointing. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're living life without it, it's like running your car without oil in the tank. We don't want to do that. You wear out. You wear down. And sometimes you'll break down because you don't have the oil. Amen? We've got to have the oil. So I want to encourage you this week, spend some, get in the closet, spend some time and ask him, Father, I don't want what man is telling me I need to have for the anointing. I want what you want me to have and the way you want to give it, I'm open, I'll receive it. Father, I don't want to leave my closet until I have it. Now I have found with God, he respects boldness. He says, come confidently and boldly before the throne of grace that you might have grace for time of need. And so you come boldly. Father, I'm not leaving here until I have the blessing. Now, who else did that? Remember? Anybody wrestle with God? Who, who wrestled with God? Jacob said, I, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. He wrestled all night and he got his blessing. And then God changed his name from Jacob, which meant deceiver, to Israel, which meant overcomer. It might be. If you wrestle with God this week and refuse to leave until you have your blessing, heaven may give you a new name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. God. Isn't that good? We're in the season. So it actually says, ask of me in the time, I think it's in Zechariah, ask of me during the time of the latter rain and I will send you showers. All right. We're asking during the time. See if you can find, see if you can find that. We're asking during the season, amen? One thing I know about Shavuot and Pentecost, when God pours out his spirit, he does it so that we will use it and give it away. It's not to elevate man, it's to elevate him. But now I know that if, if he does, if he elevates him in your life, you get elevated too. But it's about him. Zechariah 10.1, what does it say? Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give the showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Amen. You know, I had the feeling last night that when we were praying and seeking the Holy Spirit, seeking God, we just got, the whole area here just got inundated with showers. And I was thinking, we're... You know, we're asking during the season of the latter rain, and he is sending spiritual blessing along with physical blessing Amen. upon this area because we're asking during the time. He says, I will send flashing clouds. What's a flashing cloud? That's lightning. Did we have any lightning yesterday? <laughs> flashing clouds and rain. I believe we're entering into a season in 2017. And if I had some things to share with you, I'd put it on the screen. But there are multiple prophetic pointers to 2017. Some of you are aware of them. This is the 50th year since Jerusalem came fully back into the hands of, of the Jews. And there are prophecies that point to that, that actually carry down to 2017. Now, I don't believe in setting dates for things, but I do believe in, si in times and seasons. And we know that, for example, uh, the four blood moons, that, are, that they always appear just like clockwork on the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. That's just an accident, right? No. It's not an accident. 
God's using those signs in the heavens to pinpoint our day and hour. And it says in Joel chapter 2, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, I will turn the, the, uh, the sun into blood or the moon into blood and, uh, and the sun into darkness before my coming. That just happened in 2014 and 2015. Signs pointing to our day. 800 years ago, a Jewish sage, a prophet in Europe, he prophesied that using the Jubilees, that Jerusalem would fall into the hands of the Turks for 800 years. 400 years, I got that wrong. And um, 300 years after he died, Jerusalem came into the hands of the Turks, and to the day, it was in their hands for 400 years. And then he said there will be another Jubilee, and it will be in no man's land. It will not be fully in anybody's hands. And then it will be another jubilee, and it will fully come back into the hands of the Jews. And that happened in 1967. That jubilee prophecy was fulfilled. And then he said there's going to be one more jubilee, and at the end of that jubilee will come the reign of the Messiah's kingdom. Hallelujah. That is 2017. That ought to give you pause. We're entering in the season of his reign. Now, that doesn't mean he's coming back in 2017. But I believe it does point to a time of harvest, a time of him establishing his dominion and his kingdom on earth so he can finish the work. That's this year. And he wants us to be a part of it. I feel honored to be a part of it. There are multiple prophecies right now that are pointing to our day and time that the prophets long to see. But if we're going to be effectively a part of that, we have to have our own Pentecostal season. We have to have our own filling and baptism of the Spirit to walk in it. Last year's anointing won't cut it because this is a different season. I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I feel so strongly about it. We have to press in. It's not automatic. You're not just going to wake up and yawn and you get your anointing. You've got to spend time in the secret place of the Most High and contend for it if you're going to walk in it. Is this understandable? And I would encourage you. Set your priorities. Nothing is more important than Him right now in your life. And if you're too busy to have time with Him, you're too busy. Too busy to have time to pray, you're too busy. And I think that what we're going to find, because of His priority... There's going to be a hunger. People are going to show, start showing up at churches as God's Spirit begins to, to move and say, I haven't been to church in 40 years, but God woke me up this morning and told me to come to your church. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. God sent Paige to our church when we were Abundant Life. Told her to go there. She thought it was over the big church. And, and uh, Josh went outside and found her over there looking, wanting to know you know, when, you know, what about the church? And he invited her to come and join us. But she was being obedient. She was, God said, go, go find a church. I want you to go find a church and sent her there so she could find us. I believe God sent Olivia to us, and we're glad that he did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he's talking about the... Uh, the story of the four guys that tore up the man's roof in order to get somebody in the presence of God. Hey, listen, when the presence of God is actually, the fire of God is in the church, people will come watch it burn. People will break down the door to get in. And it's coming. I feel the, the, the increase of the anointing in our little group, it's growing. And I don't want it to be so thick when you come in here, you just step into the presence of God. The cloud of His presence will be here. And so we're going we're to consecrate this place before we leave today. We're going to anoint it because now we're here full time. It will be protected. There's also a group that meets in here on Sunday. But the God will protect this space as a habitation of his glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, don't be surprised if God starts sending people in your life that need healing, that need deliverance, that need hope. And, and some of you are going gonna, gonna to automatically say, because you don't feel maybe qualified, uh, if I could just get them to see Vondel. 
if I could just get her to see Greg. No, no, no. God wants to use you. And so you give them your testimony. You tell them what God has done for you. And then pray for them. You don't have to give them a, a, a big Bible study. You don't have to give them a lot of philosophy or theology. Just tell them what Yeshua has done for you. Amen. And how he's made a difference for you. And ask them if you can pray for them. And the Holy Spirit will follow them. And you'll find people weeping. You will find people crying out and getting set free because the Spirit of the living God is operating and it's not about you and me. We're just vessels. And he wants to use us to release that in people's lives. Amen. I've been in situations, I've been in situations where I went to see a patient in Fresno, California and I'd been to see her several times and she, she was a Baptist lady. She loved the old hymns and I'd sing to her. She said, oh, thank you, chaplain. But I fasted for three days because I just felt like I needed some spiritual renewal. And I went to go see her. I stepped in the front door. It was a small house, and you could look through the, through the living room to her bedroom where she was in a hospital bed. And as soon as I stepped through the threshold, her arm went up, and she said, Get away from me! Stay away from me! Leave me alone! And the daughter, who was enough spirit-filled, realized what was happening. She said, that's demonic. I said, yes, it is. Now, how is it possible I could be in her room and bring a good, nice, religious hymn and that spirit didn't react? But I came in after fasting and prayer and the anointing of the living God and that spirit couldn't stand to be in God's presence. And it reacted. And so we proceeded to cast it out. The difference that a fresh anointing of the spirit of God will make and not just us, but in people's lives. I, th I think of some of the people that were involved in the healing revival that carried such an anointing. They could get on a bus and people would start weeping and say, man, who are you? Because the presence of God followed them everywhere they went. I want that. I don't think we've arrived. I, I, I think we're just at the point where God's telling us to get thirsty. Because we're going to see more than we've ever seen. And you don't have to be a Billy Graham. You don't have to be somebody who's gone through seminary. You just have to have the love of God in you and some spirit. And you can do more than ever, any preacher on earth can do with just walking with that. He'll do it. Could you stand with me for prayer?